Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We have a great panel today. I'm so excited to hear about their recent studies and publications and investigations. If you are interested in cannabis um, from an environmental perspective, or you're just an enthusiast or a policymaker, this is gonna be a really fun panel today. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can always uh, drop them into the chat. You're able to direct them to all the hosts and panelists or a specific person. So feel free to use that function. You can always visit our website, crc.berkeley.edu to see last semester's panels. And I'll be posting this semester's um, Zoom panels shortly. Um, you can also read our science briefs, which are uh, short summaries of our peer reviewed research. We also have some great videos um, and uh, of course, all of our publications. You can also go to the people section and learn a little bit more about each of the researchers who contribute to the Berkeley Cannabis Research Center. Um, I wanna thank the Resources Legacy Fund, um, the Agricultural and Natural Resources Department, the College of Natural Resources, uh, the UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix, the Department of Cannabis Control and the Campbell Foundation for making our research possible. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about cannabis and hemp science. And I'm very pleased to have uh, Houston Wilson, Daniel Putnam and Lee Tian with us today. My name is Laura Herrera um, and I'm a cannabis researcher who's been working in the space for about 11 years. Um, my role with the CRC is a digital communication specialist and outreach, um, kind of leveraging my contacts and my experience in the uh, pre-legal and uh, legal industry. Um, and I'm really passionate about social equity and, um, and social justice in uh, cannabis legislation. So uh, today, when we talk more about the science, uh, we'll be able to make those connections between um, what's happening in the cultivation space and with the researchers who are actually studying the plant uh, from a scientific perspective. So why don't we just get started and um, I'll pass the mic over to Houston Wilson. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for the opportunity to participate in this panel today. Everybody can see my slides, look good? Cool. So I'm an assistant cooperative extension specialist in the Department of Entomology at UC Riverside. Um, I'm a bit unique uh, being cooperative extension faculty and my lab is actually based off campus at the Kearney Agricultural Research and Extension Center which is just outside of Fresno. I've been doing uh, this work um, in California for about 10 years now, and this work on cannabis in particular for probably about four years. Uh, more recently, I've also become director of the UC Organic Agriculture Institute, which really doesn't have anything directly uh, involved with cannabis uh, quite yet, but there is some certification I'm seeing around industrial hemp for uh, regenerative organic, uh, which, which kind of may pull our organic work into the, the hemp or marijuana realm at some point. You know, more generally, my, my lab is a focused on orchard and vineyard pest management. So we do a lot of uh, applied research and extension to develop alternative practices that can reduce the impacts and use of chemical pesticides in agriculture. So the focal crops that we work on include almonds, pistachio, walnut, figs, grapes and a number of other perennial crops, but also cannabis. And just listing here a couple of uh, uh, different key insect pests we work on in orchards and vineyards. So kind of a wide ranging research program under this umbrella of improving the environmental performance of these uh, cropping systems in California. Some of the, the work we do, uh, as, as I mentioned, it's really an applied type of research. Um, so there's a whole host of different strategies uh, that we address with our work and just listing some of that stuff here. And that's backed up by other studies on the biology or basic ecology of a organism uh, as a way to figure out how we can better intervene uh, for its management. And then of course, working with industry and, and other end users to promote adoption and scaling of, of key practices. So I sort of came into the cannabis space uh, based initially on my work on vineyard pest management in the North Coast. There was a lot of uh, marijuana production that I was coming into contact with 
in and around some of these vineyard operations. And that was right around the time of, of legalization in 2016. And some of the informal interactions I was having uh, at the time with growers was really signaling a need for uh, best management practices uh, generally in marijuana and hemp production, uh, but specifically with, with regards to pest management. So 2015 uh, and 2016, I uh, worked with uh, Van Butsick at UC Berkeley, um, where I was at the time doing a postdoc, uh, to carry out some preliminary meetings with North Coast marijuana growers and just discuss ways to engage with the UC. Um, and it, it, in parallel, some conversations with the university itself about how we could engage with uh, both marijuana and and hemp. Um, in 2018, we conducted an online survey of marijuana production with a number of uh, collaborators listed here, many of them with UC Berkeley. Uh, and that resulted in a publication here. I've got a screenshot of it on the right. First known survey of cannabis production practices in California, just as an attempt to get closer to understanding what is happening on these farms because of the, the restrictions we have on us uh, kind of preclude our ability to actually go and collect information and data from these farms. More recently, I've, I've started to pursue some more in-depth work, uh, two major kind of thrust here. One is a really focused effort to look at marijuana production in Santa Barbara County, again, with a wide range of collaborators. This is a project funded by the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And then I've also branched into industrial hemp more specifically, not just as an analog of marijuana, uh, to develop similar things, looking at production practices, uh, insect control, things like that, with a range of collaborators, including a postdoc in my lab now, Katie Britt, uh, with UC Riverside. So there's a, there's a ton of limitations around cannabis production. There's a ton of information that growers have, and, and we're trying to figure out how to work with them to augment that with some scientific underpinnings. Uh, the survey work we're allowed to do uh, has certain limitations to it, and we, we really need to figure out a way to get on farm and to work with this plant material uh, and with, with, can, with marijuana. Uh, we, we can work with industrial hemp at this point. And then, of course, finding funding to support this type of research and extension work. It's such a nascent area that not a lot of uh, funding is, is necessarily that clearly available, especially for marijuana uh, production. So in the interim, we continue to do our survey work. We're, we're doing some uh, insect sampling by mail with marijuana growers and trying to build extension networks around both crops. And just to, to reiterate here at the end, you know, this is a new crop in the California ag landscape. There's a range of uh, stakeholders that are looking for guidance on best management practices. And while marijuana and hemp production are not inherently detrimental to the environment, without technical support, uh, there, there's always a risk of that. So I think I've hit my five minutes or even gone over. Here's my contact information and just looking forward to the discussion here in front of us. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Houston. So now let's move on to Daniel Putnam from UC Davis. Okay, so my name is Dan Putnam. I'm a, um, a faculty member here and a cooperative extension specialist at UC Davis and work primarily with, with forage crops, including alfalfa and sorghum and lots of other alternative crops, switchgrass and so forth, um, and mostly on irrigation issues. Um, we've been doing work on um, adaptation of, of industrial hemp over the last uh, three years, with uh, primarily with Bob Huppmacher, but also with uh, colleagues in in our department and also with farm advisors spread throughout California. Um, those of you who are familiar with industrial hemp, um, in 2019, there was a fairly high um, acreage in the state and nationally, there were hundreds of thousands of acres planted. But in 19, uh, 2020 and 21, we had significant drops because the markets um, uh, were uh, overestimated, let's put it that way. But there were a significant number of fields that had poor, highly variable growing conditions. There were some successes too, but in a lot of failures um, and many of them due to high THC content, but uh, lots of questions on the part of farmers and, and, um, and practitioners uh, for industrial hemp. And I, I just wanna clarify, I'm talking about hemp production, not marijuana production. So um, I, I've always been involved with new crops and new opportunities for farmers. And this is one of the things that I felt that we needed to develop along with Bob Huppmacher and others, uh, better information about how to grow the crop. And that's the reason we, we jumped into this about three years ago. So obviously we have a crop that has multiple markets, uh, either for um, 
fiber, for seed, for grain, um, or for CBD extracts uh, of the uh, inflorescences. When we sat down and thought through this, we thought that really the most uh, interesting component of industrial hemp for California was probably in the flower production, that is the colas and the extracts that could be obtained. We're typically a very expensive place to do agriculture. And, and so those, uh, we probably could not compete with uh, lower cost of production areas for either fiber uh, production or grain production, but we could possibly uh, participate in seed, uh, seed production for planting. So here's a series of, uh, of uh, trials that we've had over the last three years. Uh, Charlie Brummer in, in plant sciences here at Davis is uh, conducting breeding work. Uh, we did a, a plant density study um, to, for over two years so with the auto flower types. We've done some studies on water use starting two, year, uh, starting la uh, two years ago uh, with both auto flower and full season types. Variety field comparisons, uh, we just started in last year or this year rather, uh, 2021 with fertilizer studies uh, for nitrogen and also had the opportunity to really observe some of the insects and diseases. Uh, Houston has been involved with that as well as Ian Grettenberger here at, at Davis. Uh, we did a little bit of work on herbicide injury uh, cost studies and there was uh, one trial at least done with animal science on feeding of residues to um, uh, ruminants. I won't cover all of this because we we'll just have a very short time, but um, in terms of the breeding work, Charlie Brummer is focusing in on high CBD concentrations, reduced branching, and looking for day neutral flowering types, that is photo, photo period insensitive. Uh, so, um, Many of the varieties that we grow commercially are highly branched and um, produce quite a few flowers on those branches. The question is, is that the ideal type if you're going to harvest mechanically or some other fashion? And so the concept there is that you would look for a variety that would be more single comb type of variety like, uh, like sorghum in this case, and that you could be grown at higher densities and uh, with mechanical harvest. Another uh, set of trials that we've done, we've worked on the auto flower types uh, because these are very short statured, very fast um, uh, maturing varieties. And we did a whole series of uh, density studies with those uh, to, to look at plants per acre for large scale production. And here's just some data. I'll give you a sense of where the data looks like. Yes, uh, density really does make a difference. Here are some of the yields so in terms of cola yields as well as total dry matter yields for these auto flower types. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the harvest index or the percentage of the dry matter, which is in the cola is very high with these auto flower types. They're about 60% uh, of the crop is produced in the, in the inflorescence, which, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. And actually, if you look at these auto flower types, which are you know, anywhere from 18 inches to 36 inches in height. Um, you know, certainly most of the CBD is concentrated in the buds, but even the whole plant has actually got a respectable CBD amount um, that, uh, so in terms of extraction, you could consider harvesting the entire plant. Uh, we embarked upon some irrigation studies, uh, started um, uh, two years ago. Um, and so the questions here, are what are the water requirements of, of hemp? Uh, can we deficit irrigate the crop? Um, and uh, what's, this, what's that impact on CBD production? And we have multiple sites, including some sites in Oregon that we're collaborating with uh, colleagues in Colorado as well. Just to give you a sense of some of the data from uh, the first year of that study, these are the auto flower types. You see a little bit of a response to irrigation moisture, but actually they do quite well with 40% of the estimated ET. Um, and the auto flower types, the full season types have very, very different stature and they respond quite a bit more to, because it's a longer season crop, uh, to higher levels of irrigation water. And uh, these are two different varieties that we tested. Uh, and this is primarily a function of length of season. Uh, when you're talking about a 75 to 85 day crop, um, you have a much lower water requirement, even at 40% uh, of, of the estimated ET. 
uh, compared with the full maturing types. And uh, this is evapotranspiration for those of you who are not familiar with that. Um, and um, let's see where, uh, this is a very variety dependent uh, result. There's really significant differences between the varieties in their water requirement. We would estimate about 12 to 17% uh, inches uh, re water requirement for the autoflower types and between 20 and 25% uh, for full season types. Um, and, and we're still examining the issues of THC and, and CBD concentration, but not likely to be significant. The main issues are one of um, water requirement over the season. Uh, nitrogen studies began this year, 2021, with five nitrogen rates and four varieties. You can see here, um, uh, the, uh, we compared both the autoflower and the full season types. Uh, here's well-fertilized uh, hemp compared with a low level of nitrogen uh, applications. So there are some pretty significant differences due to nitrogen. So if somebody tells you that this crop does not require water or fertilizers, I, I would I guess cause that uh, call that into question. I think some of the data will will be self evident there. We also do, were able to do some work on sampling and monitoring of the colas uh, for CBD content. This is really a big challenge for farmers. Um, and uh, some of the data we produced over the last couple of years, you can see the relationship between the CBD concentration here and the THC concentration here. So once we get over about twelve to thirteen percent. Uh, CBD, you're much more likely to see that crop, uh, say, go hot, or what we say, you know, which is basically become uh, uh, a marijuana crop, um, but not really a marijuana crop. It's just a little higher, too high for the, le meaning the legal definitions for CBD producing industrial hemp. Keep in mind that there's a tremendous amount of variation within uh, plant to plant variation within those uh, trials. And you can see here, even though the averages are fairly reasonable here, but in individual plants, these are individual plants, could be higher or lower. And so you have to use a, uh, uh, a multiple, take multiple samples in order to get that variation down to a reasonable level. And this is some modeling we did. If you save an average of 0.26, you can have, if you only take a few samples, you can have anywhere from uh, very hot to very uh, le uh, low, CB, uh, THC content in that sample. Lastly, we've had a whole series of uh, observations. Uh, Houston uh, has been involved with that. Uh, and also um, Ian Grettenberger here to identify what the pests are. We've had probably the most prominent problem has been Lepidoptera worms. Uh, and many of the growers actually are using uh, insecticides because uh, organically approved insecticides. Um, um, with us in a struggle to prevent this kind of damage. Uh, so, um, so the key issues overall, we have to really think of these as systems. There's a really significant um, variety issue uh, between the full season types and the autoflower types. They represent really different kinds of growing systems. Full season types are tend to be low density, tra using transplants, higher biomass with lower harvest index and lots of plant residues, and, and also a crop that uses more water and is a longer season crop, probably a higher nitrogen demand as well. And the question is, it's maybe primarily hand harvested, although there's some debate about that as well. Autoflower types represent the opportunity to uh, plant at higher densities, probably direct seeded more than transplanted with a low biomass and high harvest index, lower yield levels more, more than likely, but uh, having lower plant residue and the possibility that you could actually harvest the entire plant. So uh, these represent a lower, uh, lower um, say resource use scenario, particularly for a water short year. So with that, I think I'll just uh, draw it to close and we'll wait till we have questions. Thank you so much for all that data and those uh, pictures as well. Um, let's move on to Professor Lee Tian.
So, so my name is Li Tian. Uh, I'm a professor uh, in the Plant Sciences Department at UC Davis. I, I also have a, an additional role as the co-director of the Cannabis and Hemp Research Center uh, also at UC Davis. So uh, my research is uh, slightly different from uh, Professor H uh, Wilson and uh, Professor Putnam. So uh, we're in the uh, area of uh, plant biochemistry. So we study chemicals that are, that are made in cannabis sativa. So that is collective name for both marijuana and hemp. Um, so um, I, I, I'll start with this actually uh, research, uh, the review article that was published uh, earlier this year by our group uh, on flavonoids in cannabis sativa. I know we often hear about cannabinoids and terpenes. You know, it, even if you're not the, the scientific research field, you hear about these chemicals uh, from the cannabis plants. But there is another group of important chemicals, flavonoids, that have shown bioactivities in humans. Um, in this review article, we highlighted the knowledge gaps. So the, what we don't know about their biosynthesis in plants, their bioactivities in humans, and also um, some of biotechnology approaches that can be applied in cannabis to improve our knowledge. So uh, there's three research foci in my lab. Um, we start with uh, try to interrogate um, flavonoid biosynthesis in cannabis. And also we, we're really interested in understand, uh, to understand um, how actually the, these compounds are made and they interact with cannabinoids and terpenes within the plants because you know, they're not in existence in isolation. So you're, if you're interested in cannabinoids and terpenes, you should care about flavonoids as well, because how they're made affect how much we have in the plants for the other compounds. So ultimately, really, this knowledge, you know, it's not just basic science, it's applied research. Uh, we want to understand, right, how these environmental conditions, like, you know, in the scientific world, we talk about biotic, abiotic stresses, uh, but these are really like, how, how about the weather conditions? If we're in drought, if there's salt stress, if they're pests in, in the environment, like what uh, Professor uh, Wilson or Putnam's, uh, Putnam would have talked about, right? So the pests in the environment and, and you know, if there's not enough water and how these conditions can affect the production. Of, of the of these chemicals, including you know, cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, right? So and how you no know, nitrogen use, not so these are really management regimes can affect their production. So so these are overall theme. So this is also through uh, the, the collaboration as well. Okay, so. Um, let me go to the next one. So I only have two slides. So this is exactly my last slide already. Um, so I just want to put a plug in for our center. So the Cannabis and Hemp Research Center at UC Davis is co-directed by myself. Uh, I represent the plant science discipline, environmental science, and then my co-director, uh, distinguished professor uh, Cameron Carter, uh, he's a, a in psychiatry and behavioral science. He represents uh, biomedical research uh, disciplines uh, of uh, cannabis uh, research. Um, we actually research at UC Davis is a uh, pretty broad on this topic. So that ranges from, you know, hemp agronomy and breeding that uh, Professor Putnam just uh, talked about in his presentation. Uh, we also have experts uh, on analytical and organic chemistry, biochemistry. There's also range to uh, community development. So uh, we have colleagues just published papers on really the banking for cannabis growers, right? So they, they do, they interview a lot of girls and they, you know, try to work with uh, some of the girls, right? Try, you know, work on uh, the community development issues, and then, like you know, I'm not going to read through this, but you can you can read this. And then we also on the biomedical research side, uh, we have colleagues working on really understanding the impacts of um, cannabis use on, on human health, right? Pain management, neurodevelopment, and, and some other diseases and also metabolic syndrome. So it's really broad. And you can hear about this research at our uh, monthly research forum series. So we have it um, usually on the third Thursdays of each month at 11 o'clock. Um, so you can find 
the recordings of previous webinars at cannabis.ucdavis.edu uh, slash forums. So we record all of our forums and you can also find the schedule for next year pretty soon on the same website. Okay. Um, just lastly, we, you know, it's our interest to build relationships with uh, external stakeholders. This include the government agencies, other universities, and also industry partners and girls like you. You know, some of you are probably attending as girls. Uh, even pre uh, this pandemic, we had uh, like brown bags web uh, seminars or like meetings uh, that we actually meet. Uh, the, the stakeholders in person. So right now we're doing these uh, we're Zoom meetings. I think that's all I have for now. I just don't want to go over time. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about uh, our research and also our center uh, during the Q&A uh, session. Thank you so much, Professor Tian. Uh, and last we have Dr. Rachel Nock, who rounds this out very nicely because she is an expert um, in cannabinoids and human health. I'll do a, a very brief intro to kick us off into Q&A. Um, yep, I'm, I'm Dr. Rachel Knox. Um, about me real quick, I'm a, uh, a member of a family of four doctors, an attorney, and an MBA. Um, I had to shout out my mom and my brother who are, are Cal alum. They would, they would, I would be remiss if I didn't do that on their behalf. But um, yeah, we're a family of physicians uh, hailing from the conventional space who pivoted collectively around six years ago um, to specialize primarily in the nascent fields of endocannabinology, uh, which is the study of the function, dysfunction, and modulation of the endogenous cannabinoid system in broader endocannabinoid dome um, and cannabinoid medicine, right? So the practical application of cannabis pharmacology and cannabimimetics to the clinical setting. Um, we have a combined 25 years of experience in this space. Um, my fam is round out by Zach. I got to call him out as well. He is the uh, immediate past vice chair of the Oakland Cannabis Regulatory Commission. And his wife, Lawanda, actually runs the technical assistance to a number of California social equity programs within the compliant THC market. Um, my personal background uh, includes a lot of leadership. I'm the immediate past chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission, primarily advising our state and our regulatory agencies on um, improving our medical cannabis use program here. Um, uh, my family is involved in a, a few enterprises. Um, you know, we founded our, our own education company, Dr. Knox, and this, this is our clinics here, American Cannabinoid Clinics. Um, but what's so important to me, and which is the, the bulk of my work today, is um, launching and running the cannabis health equity movement. Um, out of this movement, it is truly a movement of coalition uh, members of like mind who've come together to champion this concept of health equity in cannabis. Um, our first organization to launch was our ACAM, our Association for Cannabis Health Equity in Medicine. It's the one and only BIPOC professional medical association in cannabis around uh, health equity. And Chem Alliance, our recognized C3, where we, we push what we call our esteem curriculum in agronomy, science, technology, engineering, art, model policy, and medicine. Um, you know, I'm glad I'm here talking to, to folks involved in agriculture and uh, ecology. And so just to level set where I'm coming from as the basis of my questions here is through a lens of sustainability. Um, the the e famous e ecologist Robert Goodland coined total sustainability as the sum of four pillars, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, human sustainability, and social sustainability, and said that if we're not investing capital across these four pillars, we're never going to achieve total sustainability. And so I like to ask the question, what does the state of human health tell us about our commitment to ensuring sustainability? Not much, right? People are sick. One in 1.5 adults in our country is sick with something chronic. And research is telling us that one day we might be able to map all disease processes, disease states, diagnoses, back to some sort of endocannabinoid system dysfunction or broader endocannabinoid dome dysfunction. On this uh, slide right here are um, disease processes that are considered classical diseases of endocannabinoid system dysfunction. 
And why this matters is because we can transpose those sort of determinants of total sustainability um, to the determinants of well-being. And as you can see, we created, we, in that process, we create an, an academic tool to really assess the state of our determinants of well-being across those exact same pillars. And it's from these pillars that in the cannabis health equity movement, we created the chem pillars of health equity. Health equity, we define and we share this definition with um, the Oregon Health Authority uh, here in my state, Oregon, um, as the assuredness of access to full health and well-being. And we can measure, right? We can measure this assuredness across yep, these same pillars, economic equity, environmental equity, human equity, and social equity. Now, why this matters is because right now in cannabis, we're talking about this concept of equity, maybe social equity, but we need to take it a, a step deeper. We define cannabis health equity as the assuredness of that cannabis policies and regulation, uh, leverage the economy, taxation, research, and utility of cannabis to achieve health equity and why because we know that cannabis across all its varieties, right? Cannabis sativa uh, species has 50,000 and counting uses, right? Across agriculture, soil remediation is just one example as you all know, um, but we can replete the soil, right? We can grow more nutritionally dense foods to satisfy environmental equity and even human equity needs. Across industry, Again, this audience already knows, right? We can innovate into sectors um, that will create lots of jobs while creating meaningful impact um, on the ecology of things. Medical, this is where the entirety of our medical use and adult use in our hemp cannabinoid marketplace resides, just sort of a drop in the bucket of the potential of this plant. And then lastly, nutritional. I like to say from root to seed, this plant offers us a bounty of nutrients. Um, and so this, this is, in my opinion, the landscape of the opportunity that we have with cannabis to identify and provide um, our society with true root solutions to the socio-ecological and medical disparities that are at the root of right, poverty um, and disease in our country. So that is my intro. I'm gonna kick it over to the panelists in a moment. Let me level set here and stop sharing. So that's my lens as a clinician, a family uh, medicine and functional medicine doctor in training. Um, and when, I'm, when I consider the state of human health, I'm always wondering what's at the root cause, right? What's at, what's at the root of the problem? I wanna ask this question to our panelists, if you all could come off screen and, and, and folks in the audience, if you have any questions too, please post them and I'll do my best to get to them um, and read them you know, in concert with the conversation that's happening in real time here. Um, so my first question, anybody can answer. Despite cannabis uh, being an agricultural staple to civilization spanning multiple millennia, we find ourselves in this place today starting at the beginning, right? Rediscovering the plant's potential. Um, I tried just now to, to, to cover that um, in five minutes or less. So with respect to agronomy and its inherent impact on ecology, what foundational questions are you and your departments trying to answer in tw really 2022 now about the plant species cannabis sativa and its cultivation as what's really the bedrock of the hemp medical use and adult use cannabis markets? Um, we are, you know, at this stage, it is very fundamental stuff. Just literally what arthropod species do we find on this plant? And does that, you know, composition change as we compare sites that are indoor versus outdoor, coastal versus inland, southern versus northern California? Um, and a lot of that we're, we're doing both through direct sampling to the extent possible, but we're also really cognizant of this deep body of kind of grower knowledge that's been developed uh, over decades of people, you know, farming this plant. And so trying to kind of bridge those things together, there's, there's, you know, that, that's where some of the survey work comes in and then we, you know, verify that with some of our insect sampling. Um, that's really what's most immediately in front of us. And then I would, I would say, you know, looking way down the road, like, it's a very interesting plant. It's very chemically active. There's a lot of multi-trophic interactions that are probably taking place with, with insects feeding on that plant and, and they're kind of 
use or, or interactions with defense compounds and things like that. And there's some more interesting kind of ecological science, but really as a starting point, it's like what insects are there? How can we best monitor and manage those in a safe way? And, and then kind of from there, it opens up quite a bit of additional research activity. Yeah, to answer Rachel, answer your question a little bit more. The the um, you know my my interest has been in uh, how how a farmer could produce this crop with a minimal of negative impacts on the environment and maximizing uh, maxim, maximizing some of the positive things that we think hemp might provide. Um, and uh, keep in mind that that hemp being a non legume uh, means that. That it's, you know you have to provide some sort of source of missing nutrients that might not be there uh, in the soil for for maximizing yields and, and production, uh, and that in this case is a, nit a nitrogen issue. But that could be surprise. You know, I always think of like soil health issues, which is you know we're very very concerned about soil health long term, and a lot of that has to be uh, thought of as a whole system. In other words, you you think of Say if a grower grows tomatoes, which also requires uh, fertilizers and water, and you're growing corn or you're growing uh, tree crops and so forth. So, you know, thinking of this, you know, how this fits into a, a cropping system uh, sustainably, and this is the reason we were so interested in the water issue because uh, drought has is raining today, <laughs> but. Uh, the fact is, you know, we live in a fairly arid region, at least in southwestern uh, parts of, you know, up in Oregon uh, or Portland, you get quite a bit of rain. But, you know, here we're always reminded that water is our number one limiting resource. And, and um, we don't want to introduce a crop that's going to require a tremendous amount of water year in and year out. Um, and that's why it was so interesting to see that some of these short season varieties actually could be grown with very low water uh, irrigation water. Um, by the way, there's a real advantage to the West in general. I mean, this is um, Oregon included and Washington State and Idaho and other places to growing in, a, in an arid or a drier environment because of lack of diseases. I mean, uh, the um, Eastern growers, we've been in touch with people in Kentucky and other areas uh, have a lot more challenges with, with diseases than we do. Um, and, and so there's some real advantages, but the big disadvantage is the fact that we don't, you know, sometimes we'll hit a drought year and, you know, you don't want to be stuck with a crop that, that you know, you have to pump deeper in, into the profile to, so this, this is, you know, the, the um, making sure that we, we are introducing a crop that, that um, doesn't have a negative influence on our resource base. Yeah, I, I think I can add a little bit. So because, you know, the hemp is, has been, because there's long prohibited status of this crop, so there are a lot of unknowns. So that's why, you know, Houston mentioned that, you know, start with some survey work, right? We need to understand. So what are the paths? What are the environmental stresses in, you know, uh, that are present? And then you know, we have the expertise to move into this crop to solve this problem. So for us, we, we really try to understand, really, you know, people are interested in the fact the chemicals, uh, obviously, but then you know all of these practices affect the petrochemical production. So there's even a, a question in the chat uh, asking Houston about like you know if some pests could be a positive for you know the cannabinoid production. You know, I'll, uh, let him answer a question. But you know that's something we're researching into. Really, you know, is a complex uh, really answer. And then also I just also want to add that. Um, you no, know, it's really beyond this agronomy and also right some plant uh, environmental stress interaction. So we do have colleagues also looking into the post harvest. That's a really important part of research, really storage of this harvest, you know, the can the, 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 the tissues because that's you, you cannot directly move from the field to the CBD or some other uh, the compounds right away. So there are other like steps in, in the process that are also important that they're being researched into. So I pass this a few comments from me. No, that's great. And you know, I, I always present this 50,000 foot view, right? Of the end of the end destination. And y'all know there is a high demand for cannabinoid products from hemp to marijuana, everything in between. We all want these solutions now, but you all are really talking about the first steps <laughs> we have to take to establishing right, and securing a viable, sustainable, long-term you know, growing marketplace. Um, 
so I, I want to know how you all re respond to really the masses of people who want the solutions now. Um, and ex explain to us a little bit about the barriers, right? The barriers to a speedy process um, and maybe even some recommendations for policy or regulation that might make your jobs easier. I, I can start. I think some of the barriers, really regulatory barriers, right? The policies like about what you can do, cannot do. But however, I think the barrier you know, on top of that is really a lack of uh, science-based policy, right? So uh, sometimes the policies are made without the support of science and then really make it challenging for the scientists to do the research. So that's really put it in a nutshell on uh, like, you know, then can give examples really from really the, how the CBD content or of THC being determined, like how to sample it really, is there a really standard for sampling of the tissues? So, and then we can give you many examples. So I would just on a call earlier talking about the you know, from medical research, can you allow, uh, you know, the terminally, terminally ill patient use medical you know, marijuana in the hospital, like associated with the university. So there's also some uh, legal issues involved. So it's really, the, the, I, I think the, the regulatory issues are really pose some challenges for us or for the researchers. Yeah, there's a, Rachel, I wanna to return to something you said, Rachel, a moment ago, but uh, in terms of barriers, just to give you an example, we we produced a little, a little bit of bulk um, uh, not not a little. I mean, it's like a half an acre or something like that of of, of hemp uh, colas um, to give to FDA to you know to ex to extract the CBDs to give to FDA to to conduct research studies that would help the you know sort of a national discussion about uh, about medical medical impacts and so forth. And 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 so we were quite quite willing to help out on that you know just because we have the capabilities to do that, but. Um, it's stuck with state regulations. We can't even get the stuff uh, extracted because of the way in which the, the the extractors are regulated between marijuana and hemp and so forth. I mean, it's a little bit more detailed than that, but you know, it's just driving all of us nuts because uh, you know you, you would think you would have a a, a path uh, to 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 doing that really readily in the research community, and it's it's it doesn't happen because of uh, state and federal regulations. But um, I wanted to go back to Rachel, what you said about the demand side, because we're watching the demand side and you said there's a tremendous demand. And, and uh, you know, I, I'd like to hear more about that because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not totally sure. And, you know, this is what our, our farming community will respond. I think, you know, both small and larger growers will say, look, you know, if this is a market, we're going to we're going to figure out how to grow the crop. And, um, you know, with pests and you know all the things that we talked about we'll figure it out but we need to know whether that market is really there and that's what happened in 2019 a lot of people planted it and they didn't have the markets and so there was a lot of hemp sitting around in in barns and so forth that people didn't know what and you know spent a lot of money it was like a dollar per seed or something like that i mean they were spending lots and lots of money to produce the crop and a lot of it failed um and yet um, we need to really look at that market pull. And Rachel, that's where we need some help from the medical community. Well, it's almost which market you're talking about though, right? Well, I'm talking about the CBD in case right. of, of yeah. industrial hemp, it'll be CBD or CBD products, not, not THC type, you know, marijuana types. But I mean, you're concerned with all of those, which is fine, but you know, it's, it, you know, people who are growing it in the field or I think at least on the industrial hemp side, I guess we need to make some determinations for how big that market really is. And uh, well, for cannabinoids, right? That's, you know, which, which takes me to an, another question, I suppose, right? Are, are we focusing on the tree for not seeing the forest, right? And when I say demand, I'm talking about, yeah, cannabinoid products, low THC, high THC across the gamut. I can tell you from, from, from for those of us in the medical space, um, the industry is not getting it right, right? We, we, we simply do not have the biodiversity, the genetic diversity that we actually need to properly apply the science to um, you know, clinical management because the products we know we need for patients might not exist in the market. Lee, to your right. point, we are not informing our market with science or 
medicine and, and, and those needs. Um, but I know we are suffering from a lack of innovation across socio-ecological and medical innovations. And so that's why I like to, to show that, that slide with all of the innovations of cannabis. And there is a remarkable, and I say unfortunate, remarkable um, focus on industrial hemp for the production of cannabinoids, right? Okay, the CBD market is flooded. There's, there's too much competition. Um, but I think that's us focusing on the tree, right? At the expense of the forest. There are more cannabinoids than CBD that we care about um, and that will be necessary to be available from the wellness sector's perspective, right? Wellness is a trillion dollar global industry. Um, not just the, the, the medical use perspective, but what about everything else, right? Why aren't we talking about building housing for the homeless in the Bay Area, in Los Angeles area, using hemp innovations, hemp create, hemp wood, those sorts of things. Why aren't we um, examining the, the potential to disrupt industries, right? Hemp solutions will even provide other big markets. Right? And, and from my perspective as a functional medicine doctor, all of those solutions at the end of the day result in a healthier community and healthier individuals at the community. So when I say market, I really mean markets. Um, and I do challenge us to think well beyond the CBD market. All right, thanks, that's helpful. You know, as, as, as a crops, and as somebody who's worked a lot with what we call alternative crops or newly introduced crops, and I've worked on a lot of different types of species, if you ask yourself the question, what is the best annual plant to produce fiber for boards, right? For building materials, which is one of the things you suggested. Mm -hmm. That's an important question. If, if indeed, you know, because we use wood and so forth, but keep in mind that you're competing against rice straw, mm -hmm. rice straw, which is, has a negative value in the marketplace right now. You have to pay money to get rid of it, right? You have to plow it under or something like that. You have to compete against fairly low value uh, types of, of, of other products. So that's the, that's the difficulty of, of, of thinking through some of those things. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that you have to ask yourself that question. You know, how does it, you know, like, for example, I, you know, crotillaria is a really ter tremendous plant that produces lots of fiber. So it's called sun hemp, sun hemp. And it's a nitrogen fixer, which means you wouldn't have to add nitrogen fertilizers. Um, and, you know, canaf, there's like other crops that I've worked on. And so you have to ask yourself these hard questions, which is, does it work as a fiber crop in, say, California or in Iowa or in other yeah. locations. We tend to be so high cost here that, that it's really difficult to see. And that's the reason we sort of came up with this conclusion that uh, we, we're not gonna compete with the Canadians on grain production. And they can do in Southern Ontario or Saskatchewan, they can produce hemp up there with you know, producing grain or, or fiber much more, uh, much more cheaply than we can. And it's, uh, it's going to be really hard for us to compete. But anyway, just, well, so just a think, comment. Yeah, but so but those are the questions that need to be asked, right? Right. Um, if, we, if we can imagine together a destination we want to arrive at you know, through, through the possibilities of cannabis, um, once we do that, we can reverse engineer right, the policies we need to enact today to get us you know, down that road. And when I think about the United States and the diverse microclimates, I'm wondering, is anybody wondering? if our country could eventually have region-specific right, cultivars that are grown for specific purposes. But who is examining the market potential, right? Who's, who's examining you know, which, which um, varieties can, can Cal California grow and for what purpose versus those that New York grows and for what purpose? You know, right. I, I can right. imagine a very dynamic um, you know, su supply chain, um, but, but whose job is it to think about those possibilities. Is it the job yeah. of our esteemed research institutions, right? Our higher, you know, our, our colleges and universities like in the Cal system to figure that out for us? I think that's a comment. I'm gonna use that to kind of like go back to what <clears throat> one comment I wanted to add to that discussion about barriers. You know, it, it, there's this component of us trying to figure out how to work with this industry 
And I think any new crop or even existing crop, there's always this kind of back and forth where you have, you know, grower innovation uh, tied with commodity boards that are promoting the development of certain markets tied with UC and other academic researchers like developing technical information to support or underwrite that process. And so it's, it's really like when you're talking about whose role is it, it's this dynamic interaction between all the groups and that definitely, you know, for us with the marijuana growers in particular, there's this history of, um, you know, it's very clandestine production. And so for it to be daylighted in the way it has been, we're very much kind of like feeling each other out and like our ability to have meetings and have marijuana growers attend those. And, you know, when you've seen the state as a regulatory entity, you know, only for decades, you know, to, to have a group show up and say, Hey, we're kind of, we're from the state, from the university, but you know, we're here to help develop best practices or something like that. It's just, I see this with legal commodities, like different groups are better and worse at working with the university for a variety of reasons. And so we're really, I think in one of my slides, I was saying, you know, in addition to these surveys and stuff, the, the, the few things we're able to do, one of those is just build extension and knowledge networks, you know, and just create those relationships so that we can decide as a group, like, where do we want to go? Or as this thing evolves, like, how do we respond to changes? Uh, because as a researcher, I, I think that's what Dan was kind of asking about in terms of the demand, you know, we're sitting here like, where's this thing going and trying to read that to, to set up our research to do best address the questions that are, that are going to come up as, as it goes in a certain direction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose another way to look at, you know, demand, it's not necessarily what the people want. Um, sometimes it's what, what the people need, <laughs> um, you know, to think about it that way. There is a, there is a question um, uh, for Professor Lee. Um, yeah. It, yeah, yes. Quickly. Yeah. yes, I want I want to though pair this question with a, a broader question and, and, and folks you, you all can answer it too, um, which is, you know, what is the current and future impact uh, or a promise, right, of the biochemistry of cannabis, um, you know, cannabis sativa at large on ecology and human health? And the specific question to you. Um, is that has there been any research done showing a direct correlation between different methods of crop steering techniques consistently bringing out specific secondary metabolites? And I would just, the reason I asked my question along with that was because those secondary metabolites, as important as they are for the plant itself, that's where we're getting the medicine for the people. So, so my answer is in two parts. I'll make it quick because we're really running short on time. Uh, so the first part is, a lot of research uh, has been done in other crops. So we know the types of uh, secondary metabolites, or we call it specialized metabolites that are produced in response to you know, different type of stress factors or you know, management strategies. Um, you know, that's really like, that, that's why plants make them, right? So they don't make them consistently, they make them in response to to the treatment. So there are the phytoalexins, there's even a term for it. Um, but however, the second part of my, my answer is really not so much is known in cannabis sativa because really, you know, we were prohibited of working with these plants for many years until 2018, it becomes uh, even legal for, for, for research here with hemp. So that is really like, so our knowledge is, that's what we're trying to work on, right? So we, we, can, we can use some of the knowledge from other crops and similar uh, techniques, uh, platforms forms of research move into cannabis people quickly. So, so that's, that's my answer for that. Um, and then there's a lot of promise for that in response to Rachel's uh, comment. And you know, plant biochemistry is fascinating. So I, I think it's, it's interface with really like not only human health, right? So that's what Rachel mentioned. These metabolites are produced for the plant health. So they can grow better in the changing environment, but also for human health, right? So we use them for medicine, for nutrients. Um, so, so that is really, and also interact with agronomy, right? So, you know, with the chemical, they can help plants. Uh, plants grow better. So that's what farmers and the growers, so like they want to see, we all want to see. And then and also interact with the interaction with, 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 the, with the past, right? So if the past don't kill, kill the plants, right? So they may elicit some interesting response. They can change the, the chemical profile. So it's a really fascinating area of research that is directly related to, 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 to the application, right? So for, for plant growth and human health.
I know we're at time and I wish I had thought of this question earlier. I just, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Um, recently in, um, I think it was MJ Venture Magazine, there was an announcement of a company called um, Bioharvest Sciences out of Israel. And they have figured out how to grow trichomes from liquid media, right? Um, and so I, you know, I'm wondering what sort of technologies are, are literally like, do you guys feel under threat, <laughs> you know, by technologies like this that's, that really pose to circumvent um, the natural order of things, right? Natural cultivation and, um, you know, really the fruits of all of your labor for the benefit of those who might be consuming these naturally organically grown products. Um, I, I encourage you all to look it up, um, but if you have any last thoughts on you know, these you know, competing technologies around the world that still have yet to disrupt the industry. We're just trying to start from scratch sort of today. I have a quick comment actually. Um, we know how to grow more trichomes, but the trichomes <laughs> need to make the compounds. So, so that's, you know, we know research has done, you can get really hairy plants, right? With lots of trichomes, but they don't, they don't necessarily make more of the compounds you need. So we still need biochemistry to understand, you know, one is the plant anatomy, the structure, but the other thing is really making the phytochemicals you want. So yeah, so we know how to grow more trichomes. Yeah, I, you know, it, uh, in line with that discussion, I mean, we have to be very product, you know, product drives. I mean, the fact is that uh, Rachel, if you're recommending, you know, a certain kind of CBD or a certain type of THC or, or other kind of compounds, then that's a signal that is sent back to agriculture. And so we need to discover those varieties or those practices, which actually produce or maximize that um, for that demand. I mean, it's, it's all demand driven. And so um, Maybe the I, doctors and the scientists just need to work together. Maybe <laughs> we need to figure yeah. this out. <laughs> well, that was kind of the purpose of you know putting together these centers where you can you can mm -hmm. have a little bit of cross fertilization there. Yeah, but you know we're we're. See. I know I know a lot of schools, especially conglomerate schools, they are thinking about the interdisciplinary approach um, to cannabis, which is really cool to see. Yeah. But the other part I I was thinking about is really our our business is providing independent, you know, in, in data and information and, and knowledge. And, and we don't know where those markets will, you know, sort out. Yeah. More than likely, we, we don't know. And, and uh, probably over time, that will be proved. But, so, you know, as one who's worked on new crops that are not grown currently, like, for example, I worked on Camelina sativa, which is a very, you know, minor acreage cr crop. But eventually, you know, 20 years later became a biofuel, right? And, and uh, there were, at the time that I was working, there was only like maybe a hundred acres in the whole country. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where you do the information, you know, try to develop the, the knowledge and then hopefully over time that, that, that you know, proves, proves to be useful, yeah. so. Thanks, Daniel. Houston, any, any last remarks? No, I, I just thank you all for really you know, interesting and healthy discussion and really look forward to kind of carrying this, this dialogue forward as we keep kind of moving our research programs and, and the ways that we're able to, and hopefully we, we see some openings, you know, uh, with the regulatory, you know, restrictions and we can do more, more of this type of work. I, I think there's a clear need for it in all of our fields and, you know, multidisciplinary approach is really appreciated. So thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Laura, I will pass the mic back to you. Thank you. So um, we're at 103. Um, we had such a great discussion. I learned so much. And um, uh, if uh, anybody wants to see the recording of this, um, it'll be posted in a couple of weeks to our website, crc.berkeley.edu. Thank you to everybody on the panel and um, have a great holiday. Take care.